Okay, so um, uh, I don't know why this that's so funny, but I mean, that's okay. <laughs> I'm glad. Please feel free to ask me questions. I will I will be able to to answer. Uh, I will try to answer the questions, and and I will finish in 50 minutes. I said to say always when I give talks, I'm a professor, so I know how to finish in 50 minutes. Uh, we condensed matter physicists always uh, have some kind of an inferiority complex versus uh, our colleagues in. Uh, in other areas of physics, like high energy physics, because we, th th my colleagues always talk about these big ideas, like the Big Bang, is Einstein right, uh, string theory, all these things. I think that we work on a problem that is as interesting or perhaps even more interesting than this, which is the big question that we're trying to answer now, is what is intelligence? And I think that that's a, a, the reason that I think it's a big question is because not only that we can ask a question like this, but we can also maybe give some answers and do something useful with it. But before I start about this, for the young people in the audience, and I see there's a lot of young people that I believe that you guys are in our future, so I think that I have to tell you there's very exciting times, there is some interesting, very interesting new science, there's much to do, and it may even be useful, although, you know, who knows. Okay, so, if any of you is looking for a, for a job or as a postdoc or as a, Graduate students, I'm always looking for some good young collaborators. Contact me if you're interested. Here it is where I work. It's, you know, pretty nice. The weather is better than here, <laughs> okay? Somewhere here is my building. I have no idea where it is. I have not been able to identify it. And not only that we have uh, the beautiful sea and the great weather, but I even have these kind of things that, you know, we brag about. Uh, uh, we experiment, as you know, all kind of stainless steel and screws that cost $20 each one of them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, I even have a clean room where we do some of the things that we... <laughs> this was, they allowed me to go in the clean room when we built it. After that, they won't allow me anymore. So the motivation is the following. Uh, in 1965, and I've witnessed this myself personally. If you were a graduate, uh, an undergraduate student in 1965, and you were going around as an undergraduate student, I'm not sure that anybody would know what a, what I'm doing is a pointer, it's an, an old-fashioned pointer. There used to be this thing, and I think that most people that are in the audience will not know what the hell this thing is. This thing, uh, this thing is called a slide rule. These could do a lot of calculations. Everybody's always amazed that uh, by this kind of a thing you can do all kinds of calculations. If you wanted to fly a plane, actually, there was another kind of, uh, I think I brought it here with me, maybe not. There was a thing that looked like this, okay? So in 1965, all of us had this. I, I witnessed this in my own life. So it's not like I'm telling you a prehistory story. I'm telling you something. And this is what it used to be, the iPhone at that time. <laughs> Nowadays, 2019, this little girl, this is a second generation neuromorphic computer. Um, and I will tell you more about her. Uh, she has in her hands there, her name is Shoshana Schuler. She's the second generation uh, 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 computer. She has more computational power than the whole world had in 1960. She has it in her hands and she can use it. This is an amazing development that I personally watched. This is not some history, some, some BS that, you know, tell you that the Greeks used to do this. I watched it, this. <laughs> okay? And all this happened because of the development of this instrument that an American physicist by the name of uh, Lee De Forest invented. This was called the triode. And this is how computers worked. When I started doing, uh, well, a, a little bit before that, not that much before. And it came because of material research, developed this ugly looking instrument, which is called a transistor. And I think that we are now at the same stage of development of what I will tell you about today. So what's next? Well, here it is what, it, this is how, as I'm telling you, the computer evolved. This is the 1906, the triad was invented by Lee De Forest, uh, um, and then they had this ENIA computer in 1945. Material research led to the discovery of the, of, or to the invention of the transistor in 1947, and that eventually led to the, to the integrated circuit and the iPhone. Today we are in the same situation. There is something called 
a, a neuromorphic computer. And I'll tell you in a little bit, in a second, a little bit about it. The most recent reincarnation of this is called the True North uh, IBM computer. There's similar things that Google and similar things that Intel is invented. Developing materials can lead to, this, this, to, the, to the development of this device called the Neuristor. And I will tell you something that imitates a neuron. And then this will allow us to scale it and make it energy efficient, which is the key to what I will tell you today. Where this will lead, I don't know. I would have never predicted in 1965 when I used to use that slide rule that we will, I will, everybody will have a computer in their pocket. And in fact, there will be more computers uh, like that uh, in the world than there is people. Okay? Nobody would have, everybody would have told me that you're out of your mind. They would have taken me to the insane asylum. Okay, so what's next? Well, if you, if you fall asleep during my talk, I won't let you, but I'll throw some stuff at you. But uh, there is these three things that I can just mention. There was a, 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 a roundtable uh, uh, report that we wrote uh, in 2015 on neuromorphic computing from material science to system architecture. And there is very recently uh, an issue of the uh, Journal of Applied Physics where there's both a tutorial from me and there's a tutorial for many other pe people and there is a bunch of review papers in there. So everything that I will tell you more or less is described in there. So, so the, the idea is to tell you about how we are at the stage at which we can use quantum materials to develop neuromorphic computing but they have to be energy efficient. That is the key here. And so we have actually a, a, what is called an Energy Frontier Research Center, which just got the Department of Energy just awarded on quantum materials for energy efficient neuromorphic computer. That's it. I'm finished with the talk because that's all you have to know about this thing. Okay? And now these are the people that you see. There is a lot of people. There it is. I am the director of it, and there's a bunch of other people. There's actually, there is the first generation neuromorphic computer. That's. Uh, <laughs> Okay, my son, who is also part of this. And for the reasons of symmetry, we have a mascot. <laughs> okay. okay, so here it is the history of computing. The history of computing is, so this is a time, price per performance of computing as a function of time, and this invariably occurred in these S-shaped curves. So for instance, when the transistor was invented, there was a very fast rise. Everybody started using uh, what are called transistor radios, and then eventually it's, uh, it leveled off until the integrated circuit was invented. Now, we're at that stage. We are right here. And we, right, right here at the end of what is called Moore's Law. Moore's Law said that, uh, says that uh, as the things evolve, every year or every year and a half, the computational power increases a factor of two and the price decreases a factor of two. It's an amazing thing if you think about it. So now there's, you know, we have these computers in our pocket, which are amazing. So the question is, what's going to happen next? OK, so there is two po possibilities. It, it, what is called quantum computing, which you may have read about it in the last two days in the, there was in the news, uh, or neuromorphic computing. So, so now, just to prove to you that this is not some crazy thing that physicists, you know, we, we have this disease of, uh, of claiming all kind of outrageous things, uh, physicists, OK? about how useful we are. Just to show you that this is not just some physicist uh, daydream, the IEEE, which is the biggest society of uh, electrical engineers in the world, it says the IEEE in, uh, invented a, 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 a section called rebooting computing. And this is a global initiative launched by IEEE that proposes to rethink the concept of computing through a holistic look at all aspects of computing, from the device itself to the user interface. I will tell you from the beginnings of this. Okay, so what, are the, what about computational limitations? Why is there a limitation? The, the reason there is a limitation is because a computer is, bold, is built on something called the Turing von Neumann paradigm. And the Turing von Neumann paradigm, what it tells you is that you have a CPU, that's Turing and that's von Neumann, and uh, there is a CPU, there is a memory, and what you do through a bus, you shuttle information or instructions back and forth there. By shuttling that information back and forth, there's a lot of electrons that are flowing there. And uh, as you well know, every time you flow electrons, you dissipate a lot of energy. And that's the problem. So, so now, now, let me just make this perfectly clear. You know, many of these things have been predicted, and, and you know, who knows whether this is true. Uh, 
the silicon, end of silicon technology has been predicted that, you know, eventually the silicon guys are good coming back with something fantastic again. So I'm not going to claim here that it is for sure everything I'll tell you is correct. What I will, I will tell you is that it seems like everybody's a, in agreement with this, or a lot of people, a large majority. Okay, so there is this, this so-called von Neumann bottleneck, which, is, which has to do with the shuttling of this information between the memory and the CPU. And that's what limits computation. There's many other things that limit computation. For instance, if you try to scale it down, it used to be that the transistor looked something like this. There was a, there was a gate here and there was some, transi some, some, uh, some transistor there. And you know, as you're making it smaller and smaller, defects start playing a role. And they no longer are, you can ignore them because this device is so small that you can see the defects now. So that starts playing a role. Now, I will not bore you for all these things because uh, there is a whole list. I mean, so if you want, you can go to this paper here. But there is a lot of both fundamental uh, uh, limits, there is uh, materials limits, there is device limits, there's circuit limits. There's all kinds of limits that, uh, that make uh, uh, conventional computation come to an end. Okay? And this is very well documented. So here are the predictions of that what came. So Moore itself, the famous uh, Gordon Moore of the Moore's Law, he said by the year 2005, that's it, Moore's Law is ends. It's not true. <laughs> I mean, himself predicted. So then he revised it. Uh, like, uh, you know, like, there it is. Now it says 2015 to 2025. Pretty much everybody agrees that in this time horizon, this will end, with, except with some people that uh, know how to extrapolate to 2,600. <laughs> OK? <laughs> but except for those people, everybody kind of agrees that Moore's law will end somewhere around 2025. I may or may not see it, but I think that you, the young guys, have to worry about this. OK? So what is the solution? <laughs> well, that's the first solution. You just give up. You say, OK, my computer works fine, my iPhone works fine, and I just give up, and I'll leave with this. That's a possible solution. The second possibility is what is called quantum computing. And that may or may not work. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I'm all in favor of funding, at this stage of the game, everything. I will tell you about neuromorphic computing. So what is the idea of this? The idea of this is the following is, uh, last time I talked about this, the fastest computer in the world was this Tianhe 2 computer, second generation computer. A 200,000 processor, 12 terabytes of memory, 600 terabytes of disk storage, and it cost $400 million. Now, I will tell you this, as I've already hinted at it, I can do this for, I did it for $30,000 already. Actually, probably the second generation cost $60,000, which is this, which is uh, <laughs> Shoshana again, when she was nine, nine months old. She can do more than this computer can do, way more. One thing that she can do, for instance, the first generation, which was the father, became a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. This computer will never be a professor at the University of California. <laughs> okay, so there's many other things that they can do. Okay. All right. So what can she teach us? That's the question that I'm trying to answer here. Okay, so, so if, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, 100 years ago you wanted to come from the US to, from San Diego to Toronto, you would fly, you would do the obvious thing. You make a light thing, you lift it into the air, and then you move it. That's called the Zeppelin. Okay, so what, but that's not how we, that's how I came here. I came with something that resembles a bird that flaps its wings. It's called an airplane, okay? So you see it has a, it has a body and it has two wings. It doesn't flap its wings, but the bird indicates to us something and we learn something out of it. And that's what I were trying to do. Is see, can we learn something from a biological system that helps us into doing what we want to do? So we want to learn from biology, not create a biological system. So I'm not trying to say that we're going to make, make actual neurons that work because all biologists always tell us, well, you don't, we don't understand anything about the brain, so how can you have any hopes? Well, we don't understand anything about birds and we fly still. Okay, so I'm, I'm not letting myself be dissuaded by that. So we don't want to adopt, we want to get inspired by this. Okay, so let's take a look at the, comp uh, at the comparison to biological systems. Remember, we want to le learn, not reproduce, okay? So here it is, for instance, an energy versus time diagram. So there it is, the delay time per device as a function of power dissipation per device, okay? 
over many, many orders of magnitude in both axes. And here it is all the things, devices that you can possibly come up with. What you will notice immediately is that the biological devices are here. They are very slow, but they are very energy efficient. OK, so both uh, the two major devices, which are called the synapse and the neuron, they are in that corner where there is no devices. There is no solid state devices to speak of. So what I want to do is I want to compare the system, uh, the, the biological system with the, with the actual system. So there it is. The, the biological system has a data processing, a temperature control, an energy delivery, a hardware support, an energy production, transportation, sensory, and the total number of devices, total number of, of uh, devices in a processor. So here it is how biological system works like. Me. 2% of my body's brain. Yeah, I know, it's very funny. <laughs> so most of the processor is 2% of my whole body. 7% is cardiovascular, it's temperature control. 60% uh, is skeletal, it's just the hardware that supports me here. 15% uh, is energy production, which is the digestive system, which I, I eat too much of that, actually. And 50% just allows me to uh, go back and forth here in front of you guys. It's completely useless, OK? <laughs> and 15% is sensors, which may be relevant, actually, in some ways, OK? The number of devices is, is 10 to the 14 cells, and the number of devices in the processors, like synapses, is on the order of 10 to the 11. OK. So the processor is the smallest percentage. So if you would be an engineer and you build this thing, you build it completely wrong. I mean, you build the, the processor, which is the main thing, if you believe that the nature is trying to develop an intelligent system, you build it the wrong way. You are putting all the effort in everything else except the, the processor. Actually, this was kind of relevant. This is what's interesting about this area. You start thinking about things, and you suddenly realize there's all kind of surprising things that happen. So let me just show you a, a comparison of biological and solid state processors. So biology is made out of devices, neurons and synapses and things like that. They have a speed, they have a size, they have a reliability, a connectivity, which is what is called a fan in and fan out. There's a dimensionality, there is an energy consumption, there is a temperature, there's a noise effect, and there's a criticality, which I will tell you a second something, maybe. And then there is the architecture of this. So the brain works with one millisecond switching time. One millisecond. It's again the wrong way. The size is one micron to 10 microns. The reliability is 80%. I don't need all my brain to give this talk, actually. OK? The connectivity now, this is very large. You have 10,000 or uh, of the order of 10,000 connections of one neuron to other neuron. It is pseudo three-dimensional. I'm told that the brain has layers, and then the layers are interconnected. There's probably a third layer, so it's pseudo three-dimensional. Now, the consumption of energy is very low, 10 watts. So my brain works with 10, 20 watts. Uh, the temperature is very tightly controlled. It's between 36 and 38 degrees. Uh, I can walk around in an airport, and people can talk to me. My friends can talk to me, and they don't get confused by all the noise that comes around. And that is due to some phenomena which is believed to do with something called stochastic resonance, which I may or may not tell you about. Criticality, I will show you in a second what do I mean by that, but it's at the edge of criticality. And the architecture, I don't think anybody knows. If there is any underlying architecture, the way the connectivity of the brain is done. In the, in the technology, again, it's made out of transistors. The speed is much faster. I can make in my lab a, a, a transistor that uh, uh, switches at one nanosecond. It's much smaller by three orders of magnitude. I can make it 10 nanometers, 100 nanometers, no problem in my own lab. And I'm not the, you know, the best one on this. Uh, the reliability is much, much higher. If in this computer that I use for this talk, uh, you know, uh, two transistors fail, that's it. It won't be able to give this talk. So it's much higher. So notice here, there's 80%. The connectivity, now that's, there is something to worry about. The connectivity is much lower. So typically, in a typical architecture, there's only three to four connections of one transistor to other transistor. It is also pseudo three-dimensional. I mean, one can make eight layers of overlaying uh, uh, transistors on top of each other. Now, here is the cl clincher. The energy consumption is much, much bigger than 10 to the three watts. And you can argue about how you come to that number. 
We can argue about it, but I can tell you it's much, much bigger, no matter how, what kind of calculations we do. The temperature range is much broader. So in some sense, these, these machines are much better constructed and they work much worse. Okay? Um, it gets very confused. No noise. You don't want to put any noise on that computer there because it, 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 it's going to get bad. And I'll, I'll show you in a second that is, uh, that is far. There's nothing critical about it. This is the only reason it works in that range because you don't want to freeze your transistors or something. Or, and um, and it, it has a well-defined uh, architecture, the Turing von Neumann architecture. Okay, so let me just tell you something. How did I get into this? I started thinking I was on sabbatical, and this is what I was on sabbatical in Paris. And, you know, uh, Walter Kohn once told me that Paris leads to big thoughts. And so since then, I've been trying to go on sabbatical. So about five years ago, I went to sabbatical in Paris, and I was looking at the Eiffel Tower and started thinking about this. And I asked myself the following question. Why is a... Uh, well, a crocodile, cold bladder, this is, I, I, I learned these words just only five years ago, poikilotherm, is so much more stupid than a human being, but it can work in a much broader temperature range, delta T, 14 degrees. Whereas a, a, blood, a hot blooded animal, a delta T is kind of very tightly ranged, so a human being, two degrees, you, you're too cold or too hot and you're finished, okay? Either way. So is this fundamental or an accident? So I came back and I wrote this paper that I'm very proud of this paper because I didn't do any experiments. I didn't do any theory. We just looked it up in Google. <laughs> and it's in a pretty good journal, which is this thing. So what I will show you is the operational temperature range, delta T. So is this the range of temperatures? Remember, the crocodile is 15 degrees. Human being is 2 degrees as a function of cognitive ability. There's a way in which this cognitive ability is quantified. It's called the encephalization quotient, OK? And you know this may or may not be right, but uh, it was just recently published in this uh, neuroscience journal. So, I, so I'm really very proud of this. And here it is the plot over two orders of magnitude on this scale, and two orders of magnitude on this scale. It's a straight line. It's a straight line with a slope of one half. OK, now, this could be an accident, of course. Log-log plots are notoriously dangerous, and I am aware of that. So don't, uh, you know, I'm going to dismiss that attack, OK? Is this an accident, or is there something more profound here? What this is telling you that you don't necessarily want to have a very, tight, a, a very broad temperature range for you. Maybe having a tight. Control of the temperature is crucial. And I have a reason for that. And if you guys are asking me a question, I will tell you why I think that this is important. Okay? But nevertheless, this tells you that the obvious thing, which is build a machine that works in the broadest temperature range, is not, is not necessarily true. Okay? So let me just look at the differences between these systems, between the, between the biological system and solid state system. The architecture is disordered. Is believed. I mean, I'm not sure, but is it, and whereas in the solid state system is a Turing for Neumann, the number of devices is much larger in the biological system. The connectivity is much larger. There's the same number of devices, and the materials here are some squashy materials that I don't know how to deal with, so I'm not going to, but there it is a solid state system. The signaling, however, here is done in spiking, in time dependent pulses, and that may be somehow significant also. Okay so, uh, so, okay, so again, so neuromorphic, when you use the word neuromorphic, we're talking about doing something that is computationally useful, not biologically realistic. I mean, so I'm not trying to build a brain or anything like that. Okay? So, so what we want to do is to build a machine that works like the brain. And I don't have to tell you anything about this. You immediately know your brain is able to look at this and tell you this, there is a bull there and there is some, some, some people in there instantaneously. Because the brain is able to take things and look at categories of things, categorize things, classify things, without having to do any calculation. A computer to do a calculation there, it would take forever. So why is that? Well, so the device here, now I'm going to start getting down, farther down into the, to the device level. In the biological system, there is essentially four different elements. There's a neuron, which does the computation. 
There's the dendrites, which connect you in between neurons. There's an axon, which connects you to the synapses, and then the synapses connect you to the next neuron. And the electrical signals, the way they go, it is a voltage as a function of time. There are these pulses, okay, spikes. That's how the, the, the brain computes. Now, the architecture is very different also. So as I told you, the architecture here in the traditional von Neumann approach, that you put input data here. There's the memory unit and the central processor unit. You shuttle information back and forth there. And then the output data comes out for you after a lot of computation, very precise computation. That's not how this neuromorphic architecture works. The neuromorphic architecture will work in a different way. The way this neuromorphic architecture is you have an input data and you input it into different neurons. So there is, let's say, four neurons here. Of course, in your brain there is a few more. But uh, there's four neurons there, and those neurons are connected to what are called hidden layers. And so there is many hidden layers, and there, every neuron is connected to every other neuron, physically. What you do in the process of learning, these synapses disconnect or connect. But you start with a system completely connected everywhere. And then it goes from this to this layer. This layer kind of connects and disconnects after the learning process, connects and disconnects the synapses. Then it goes to the next layer. Then eventually it ends up into the uh, categorizing the signal and tells you, yes, this is a cat or it's a dog. And it gives you the final result. So that's what the purpose of, of this neuromorphic computing is. It's not to do a very precise calculation to double precision 16 significant figures. It is to do categorization, like I showed you, bull and people. Okay? Now, it is, uh, you know, this is not something that I invented. I wish I would have. That's not something I invented. There is this neuromorphic solution already exists. So that's both the detractor from a scientist's point of view. And the advantage of this, I know that this exists and I know that this works. So there is a solution called the, in software, you can actually simulate neurons and synapses in a von Neumann architecture. Uh, it is uh, the NVIDIA DGX2, uh, it already does it. It costs $400,000 and it uses 10 kilowatts of power. Okay? So it exists, it works in an ordinary computer, but it is very restricted. There is even in hardware, there is uh, neurons and synapses are mimicked in hardware in CMOS, which is the conventional uh, semiconductor industry. But in order to have 256 neurons, the true north has 1.3 million transistors. Lot of transistors, lot of energy dissipation. So here it is what you want to do. So if it's already none, you know, why the hell am I spending time and why do I bother you guys here? Well, there is a reason for that. If you take the, the true north, for instance, and you just upscale it by the number of neurons, which probably is not the right thing to do, because who knows whether that programming it, how do you have to program this? But you just multiply the numbers. If you multiply the numbers, you discover that in order to get to 10 to the 12 neurons, the 10 to the 15 synapses, you need 4 megawatts of power, you need 20 rooms, and you need a nuclear reactor in your pocket. That's not possible. Okay, so the question is, you know, what next? So, now this is all explained, you know, in what is called the repository of human knowledge. Every morning I go exercising, and when I go exercising, I drink a tea called the Snapple tea. Okay, and this is the cover from, uh, this is actually from a Snapple cap. But I take a picture, so I see the best stuff on, on earth. They should give me some free <laughs> cup. You know. It says the brain operates on the same amount of power as a 10 watt light bulb, okay? That's the key. Everything is in here. All the noise is in there, okay? Okay, so let me just uh, show you in a different way this thing. This uh, gentleman is uh, Duncan Haldane. Uh, he's, he was a colleague of mine at UCSD, and now he's at Princeton. And that's me, we are, uh, last year when I gave the Kavli lecture, they invited us to go to Caltech uh, to visit the JPL, and we visited JPL. And we were there and we were in front of this machine at JPL that took pictures. You could take a picture of yourself and you could take an infrared picture of yourself as well. So there is the infrared picture of me and Duncan Holden. So there is the infrared imaging of mine. And you can immediately tell here, you see the color here, the color there? 
no price, no more price. Okay. Because this one dissipates much more energy than this one. Okay? So what I'm trying to argue here, that local energy dissipation is very important. Local. Okay? So um, there is a global energy consumption also a problem. So there's a local energy consumption that you dissipate a lot of energy and you cannot have uh, four megawatts uh, being dissipated in your head, okay, or in your pocket. There is also a global energy consumption. So here it is, uh, if you look at uh, the benchmarks, presumably by the year 2035, all we will have is energy to charge our iPhones and we will have no energy for anything else, okay? So, so there is this crossover with the world's energy production, you know. So there is this other problem. So there is both a, a local dissipation and a global availability problem with energy. That's why energy considerations are very important for this business. That's why our mission is to develop, to use quantum materials for energy efficient. So it's not just like, you know, energy efficient is like saying you have a car and you want to spend less gasoline. It's more than that. It's just not possible to do what we want to do. Okay. So, so, so as I told you, the, the evolution of the classical computer was, went through this. Now we are at the stage at which we want to, to see what happens when we scale this up. Okay. So the strategy is the following. Our strategy is to explore the most promising quantum material-based solutions. So here it is. I'm, gonna, I'm telling you that material science or condensed matter physics is like the key of this. Okay? And that's why you young guys should think that you're very lucky to be born at this stage because you will see the same thing that I saw going from that slide rule to the iPhone. You will see something marvelous happening in the next 25 years. That's my claim. So here it is. So the, the future is in this, is to mimic neurons and synapses using quantum materials. But the key is, is this, is that we want one neuron, one device, one synapse, one device. None of this business of 256 neurons with 1.3 million transistors. Okay? That's the key. And the question is, can we do this? Okay? So that's why we got this, this thing. And then we have two approaches towards this. We have an approach which is based on charge, which is based on, on some highly correlated electron systems. And now I'll tell you a little bit about solid state physics, and, uh, which is based on charge. There is another parallel approach which is based on spin. It's based on some devices called the magnetic spin torque oscillators, which I will not tell you anything. Although I worked on magnetism all my life, I kept away from these aspects of this. I'm directing this whole business, but I'm trying to keep away from this because uh, I want to separate my life. Now, this work was done by these people here uh, over, uh, and so the reason I'm putting up their pictures, of course, to give them credit, so, oh, by the way, here it is, uh, you have, uh, which, uh, John, that's the guy, okay? Maybe he got his in inspiration about your work there, so, you know. <laughs> uh, so, th this guy has gone to the University of Bogota. This man uh, works now uh, uh, at a company, Thales, uh, which is an aerospace company in, in France. Uh, this uh, man is a professor at the University of Colorado. Uh, uh, this man, Javier Del Valle, he just got a major prize, an Ambizione prize, at the University of Geneva, so he's leaving my lab in a month or so. And these other two guys are looking for jobs. Uh, no, this guy is in San Diego. This guy is looking for a job, and this guy is looking for a job. So maybe some of you guys, I mean, if you know of a job, they are very good guys. Okay, so, so, so as I'm telling you, this guy, uh, by the way, this, is, this used to be a president of the United States uh, before, and he came up with this grand challenge. That's how this whole thing started. Uh, in 2015, he said, develop an artificial system that works like the brain. He didn't say make a brain. He said, works like the brain. And I mean, this was actually totally brilliant. And that's what, what led actually to our neuromorphic so solution. So what I will show you is a possible implementation that what we want to do is to imitate neuronal functions, okay? That it is charge-based. So I'm not going to tell you about the spin-based, although if you want, I can tell you later on if you ask me questions and use the internal degrees of freedom of quantum material. Now, how would you go about this? Okay, so here it is, solid, some solid state physics. Sorry, I have to subject you to some real physics. 
these are strongly correlated oxides. So it turns out that it's, it's very interesting. You, you study simple metals like, like, uh, like uh, copper. And I was told, I remember when I was an undergraduate, I was told that the way to understand the properties of copper is very simple. You put one electron in a box, and that's it. It explains everything. Why metals, insulator, everything. I was thinking, these guys are completely nuts. There is not one electron. There is, you know, 10 to the 23 electrons. How can they possibly? I mean, there's no box either. What the hell are they talking about, OK? So it was kind of very shocking to, to me. Now I'll tell you two elements. So I'll be showing you two elements that, uh, that exhibit something called a metal insulator transition, which is a fantastic effect, which nobody actually quite understands it. That it has a structural phase transition, which is coincident with that, and it's first order. What that means that it's first order is that it's hysteretic. And as I'm telling you, the origin of this metal insulator transition, is, I'll tell you in a second a little bit more, is not understood. It's still not understood after many years. And they are intrinsically disordered. And I'll tell you in a second what I mean by that. So here it is, the, 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 two, uh, this is the two elements, <laughs> vanadium and oxygen. And can, believe it or not, people don't understand this. So here it is the resistance as a function of temperature in, for over many orders of magnitudes, many orders of magnitudes. And notice here that what happens is uh, that as a function of temperature, this material undergoes a, a, a transition from being an insulator negative uh, with a uh, resistivity coefficient like this to being a metal with resistivity coefficient like that in a very narrow temperature. And here it is, this is in 10 degrees. OK, so this uh, zero is somewhere in, uh, what's in that direction? Saskatchewan or something like that. <laughs> One of those places far away, OK? So there is a very narrow temperature range. This is, uh, has this metal insulator transition. Okay, and both of these materials, and people don't understand this, believe it or not, okay? And, uh, and, uh, uh, and these are actually measurements that are done in my lab. So this is a fantastic effect. It's really a fantastic effect because it's totally unexpected. Nobody expects these things. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> now what do you want to have for a neuron? So let me just get this down to practice here. <coughs> so what you want to have to a neuron is an active element. What you want something that produces that it takes input, pulses, and produces a pulse somehow. That's what you want. So it has to be active. It has to have this property, which is what neurons have, which is called an integrate and fire. So what it has to do is it has to integrate input from many other neurons, and then at some moment decide, OK, I'm going to fire a pulse out. So it has to integrate and fire. And it has to be volatile. What I, what I mean by that is it has to reset its state once it fires, it has to go back to where it started from and sit there and wait for you. Here it is a pro, a, 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 an example of that. So this is a volatile resistive switching. I, as I told you in, the, in this review in the Journal of Applied Physics, there is an article there explaining this. This is the voltage as a function of current. <coughs> it has some resistance there, OK? And then if you, if, you, uh, if you go beyond a certain point, suddenly the thing switches. The resistance becomes, it has a metal insulator transition. And when it comes back, it comes back to the same part. So that is called a volatile resistive switching, and it imitates a neuron. I'll show you some other properties that, uh, that is similar to a neuron. A synapse has to be a passive element. That's those connections between those round blue circles that I showed you. And those connections, the way they work, is they have to be passive. And all they do is they connect the con con connectivity. They, all they control is the connectivity between, these, between the neurons between these round things, and they have to be non-volatile. Once you switched it, you don't want to continue feeding it energy, because if you feed it energy, you're losing the purpose of this whole business. OK, so it has to be non-volatile. And here it is, a non-volatile resistive switching. Again, this is a voltage as a function of current. It goes up. It switches into another resistive state. And if you come back, you come back to a different path. So once it's switched, it's done. OK? This is actually implemented in my lab now. OK, so, so uh, now the, this is uses the, there is various different kind of system. Different people have seen this kind of metal insulator transition in VO2, in neodymium, nickel oxide, in niobium oxide. Uh, and I will, not, I will tell you only about the things that we have done. Uh, the non-volatile switching has been done in titanium oxide, nickel oxide. So there's a lot of different things. And the nightmare scenario, one of the nightmare scenario of this whole business is the, how the hell are we going to decide in between all these different systems? I mean, you know, everybody, of course, claims that their solution is better than the next guy. 
I'm claiming the same. Okay. So, so the, here it is how this neuronal reaction works. So here it is a time-dependent response, a simple device, one device. You have two electrodes, you have this vanadium oxide in between, you put a constant current into it and it will spike. So here it is exactly what I'm telling you. You put a voltage pulse in and you measure the resistance of this and here it is what it does. So here it is the current that is output from this device as a function of time. You put a pulse at that stage of two and a half volts. Okay? And what happens is nothing happens. Put 2.6 volts, nothing happens. Put 2.7 volts, there is a threshold, and at that 2.7, the thing fires. It's exactly like the neurons do. Okay? Well, exactly, I don't know exactly like the neurons, but it has one of the properties like the neurons. If you, if you, uh, if you uh, put more voltage across it, 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 it fires before. Okay? So it is, it kind of smells like it's doing what it should be doing. Okay? Now, uh, um, uh, now, let's say you, you, you look at the time-dependent response of this. So as you're changing the time, as, as you're going uh, faster and faster in time, uh, slower and slower in time, then this time for it to, to this time here, it increases close to, the, close to some time. So the off and off uh, transition take place within nanoseconds. So it's very fast. Uh, everybody was, was thinking that it is not, it's actually much faster still than, than a neuronal functions, but, uh, but it's still. So now let me show you another property here, the time dependent response. So let's say you put a pulse up to the threshold, you fire the, the neuron fires. It's called a neuriston now, it has a word for it also, okay? And it fires, and then you wait for a time, some delay time, and then you put a voltage below threshold. And what it does is this. You see, even though it's below threshold, it fires again. So this, this device has memory. Somehow it remembers that it fired already once, and even if you delay for, let's say, a few microseconds, it fires at a lower threshold. So not only that it has a threshold, but it has a memory of the threshold. It has a memory that it fired before. Okay? So it, so it can take pulses in, it can fire, and it has memory of that it fired before. Okay? So this system re uh, uh, retains memory, and it was, this was published just very recently, like a month ago or something. Okay? Uh, now, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, this, this thing uh, scan, uh, spans over several decades in time, so the, the time it eventually is leaky, meaning that it, it leaks away, the, the information leaks away, and then after a while it resets to its original state. Okay, so it, but it takes you know, a long time, microseconds. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's that. Now, if you look actually at the time, at the, I mean, this is a technical part, but if you look at the time, this half time of half-life, you know, then it, this diverges at the transition temperature. Actually, if you think about it for an, one instant, I don't want to bore you with this, but it will, you will convince yourself that it should diverge at the metal to insulator transition, okay? So, spiking. So then let me tell you something about spiking. As I told you, the neurons, what it does, it, it spontaneously sometimes spikes. Well, we have made a, a device now that is actually it's unpublished work. It's, it's now, it's in press, which is the, the following. It's, there it is the device that I showed you until now. This gap, there it is the gap, see, the little gap. That is one electrode, another electrode. In top of it, you put a heater, okay? And you put a little bit of, so you bias this device close to the switching. And then you put a little bit of heat on it. And then the device actually starts firing in a spiking fashion, regularly. And we can control the spiking, we can control the magnitude of the output of the current here, and all kinds of things that we can control. This is unpublished work that uh, is somewhere being debated in the literature. Okay? So not only that it, it has a leak, integrate, and fire, it has threshold, it also can spike periodically, as you would expect a neuron to do. Okay? So here it is, for instance, the way that this spikes. I will not uh, uh, tell you there is this filament formation and I was just going to argue here that, uh, that there is, a, you know, this needed the collaboration of some diffraction people 
to the pain in my heart is the, we needed some theory also and some electrical uh, simulation. I mean some, some electrical measurement. Okay, so there are some recent papers that I want to mention to you. Actually, if you search under my name, just very recently we published a few papers. Uh, this one actually just appeared in press. Uh, okay, so this is something else. Uh, okay, so what are the issues? So this is not like this is free completely. There is lots of issues that, you know, but that's what's interesting about this field. It's not like you have to do much work to start thinking up. Which are the key properties that we want to uh, imitate from the neurons? I told you, we, we have threshold, we have leak integrate and fire, we have spiking, we have all these. Well, is this enough? Is this not enough? I don't know, who knows? But you know, that's why somebody's got to pay me to answer that question. Um, maybe there is some emergent properties when we mix them all together and we start connecting them together, maybe there are some emergent properties. What is the computational scheme? And there is some very interesting, actually, issues about computation. How do you actually do computation with this? Which, if you ask me, I'll tell you about it. There is this big nightmare scenario that everything is in the architecture and anything that I do is completely useless. That's possible. What the hell do I know? But I, again, if somebody wants to know the answer to that, they'll have to pay for it. Uh, and what is the, the role of the supporting machinery, the temperature control? Is that important? Is it important the sensing that somehow in order for the system to learn has to sense the outside world? Is the energy production Im important? As I told you, disorder is intrinsic and what I mean by that is the following. If everything relies on this metal insulator transition, this is a first order phase transition. And first order phase transition like water and ice are intrinsically inhomogeneous. You cannot have a first order phase transition that is homogeneously changes. It always nucleates and grows. And so there's always nucleus of, of two phases in there. So it's intrinsically inhomogeneous. This is something that we physicists don't like to uh, you know, deal with. Uh, we want to deal with perfect systems. Okay? So we started going from you know, the slide rule, as I showed you, and we got to, to Shoshana there. So this is not what we are doing here. Okay? So we have, uh, we are looking at these devices here, and we're trying to figure out which are the key quantum properties and building these devices. We're nowhere here in the long range goals, which is basically to build a system. The software may be very different. So, you know, she uh, has uh, her computer in her, in her hand. I don't know what's going to be next. You guys will have to tell me what's next, okay? And you guys will have to. That's what's exciting about this, okay? So let me just leave you here with a summary. So, uh, so as I'm telling you, it has been conceptually proven with conventional, energy, uh, with conventional uh, devices that this whole neuromorphic computer works. I am not trying to, it's not speculative that this thing works. It does work. Uh, the energy cost is prohibitive. I showed you that there is maybe a beginning towards a solution of some of the devices using quantum materials. There's other approaches, as I told you. So I showed you about the charge approach. There's a spin-based approach. There's even an optically-based approach. At the end of the solution, uh, sorry, at the end of the problem, I think that it is very key that to come up with some intermediate solutions. So for instance, for vision problems, it may be that neuromorphic computing will be uh, key, just to, to uh, imitate, for instance, uh, uh, the, the eye, okay? And uh, so I have to leave you with something in Spanish here because uh, this is a famous poet a Spanish poet, Antiano Cipriano, Jose Maria, y Francisco de Santa Ana, Machado, y Ruiz. <laughs> okay. And he said, caminante doy camino, se hace camino al andar. He, what he says is that what matters is not the, not the final result, but the road towards the final result. And I'm sure that whatever we do will lead to something very interesting. So I would be happy to leave you here and answer questions. Thank you. I am exactly on time. <laughs>